three dancing flame electronic candles. These are the simple mechanical candles that use a plastic uh, flame-shaped reflector with a magnet pulse underneath and an LED projecting up the front to create the effect of a flame moving about. Now, which of these do you think looks the best? Because one of them is incredibly expensive and one of them is incredibly cheap. So looking at them, which would you say is the best looking? This one here on the left is the most expensive. It's an original Luminara. The colour's pretty good. It's a golden white. It looks flamish and it looks it's got a realistic action, albeit quite fast. This is the copy, the first generation copy of the Luminara. And it's, it's okay, but the colour is just completely wrong. I mean, it, it does the effect. And this is the cheapest. This is the most recent one. And it's by far the best of the three looking at them because it's got the biggest flame. It's got the smoothest and most random movement. It really does um, change and undulate every so often. It seems to have quite a good flame effect. And it's also the lowest current one. The one with the lowest current draw will run for a very long time, the batteries. So let's open it up and take a look inside. So my favourite dancing flame candle of the moment is the Premier Dancing Flame. It's a fairly generic brand in the UK. And this one runs off three AAA cells. You might think, well, that's not going to last very long. But in reality, even at 4.5 volts with a set of fresh cells, the current draw is only 20 milliamps. I know this because I tested my bench power supply. And I ran the voltage way down uh, to the point it cut out. It cut out at 2.5 volts, um, and the movement of the flame uh, stopped operating at about 1.5 volts. So it will operate right down to a fairly good portion of the battery. 2.5 volts, fine. At 3.6 volts, which you'd expect from a set of nickel metal hydride rechargeable cells, the current draw was only 10 milliamps. So that is going to last a very long time. With a typical set of good nickel metal hydride cells, you're going to get probably about 90 hours of operation out of this. Very good indeed. Now, I've already explored this. Uh, usually with these, the candle bit is normally attached to the base by a sort of... First of all, it was a a custom moulded thing for all the different size of candles, but then latterly it was just a short section of pipe. But in this case, uh, where is a screwdriver? In this case it appears to be separate and it wasn't too hard to get out. Now this is a plastic, I was going to say plastic, it's not plastic, it's a wax case. And I've found uh, in the past that it's quite easy to break these cases, that's why I developed the technique of pushing from the top. But in this case, uh, it just, when you push that, it just pops in completely because it is just hot melt glued onto the wax. Hot melt onto wax. It doesn't sound like a great idea, does it? But it works. Um, so there's the module that flickers, and it is just a completely separate module from the base. Now, the first units of these tried to emulate the um, Luminara candle completely. And the Luminara candle originally took two batteries. In the case of the one that I showed you earlier on, uh, it takes two D cells. I mean, it's a very good quality candle. That one is also notable for being waterproof, apparently. You can use outdoors, which uh, is intriguing. Uh, you'd think outdoors that uh, you'd actually want the wind to blow the flame about itself. That's kind of appealing in a way. Um, but they used to use a boost converter to step the lower voltage up to drive the LED in the circuitry. And also, because they were quite heavy in the coil and really pumping the coil all the time, as the battery ran down, you'd see the LED flickering with the pattern of the coil pulsing, which was uh, quite unrealistic. So this one is very simple. It is just on and off. And it doesn't really matter. The current consumption is so low, it's really nothing. So we've got a big fat LED in here. The LED is huge. I wonder if they're doing that just to get a better focal point. The flame itself... Well, I'll open that up, actually. If I can open that up. Yes, we will open it up. I'll, I'll find a way to open it. Let's start with the circuit board on the bottom. So here's the little circuit board. Capacitor in the back. It's got the ubiquitous blob. It's got the coil sat up on what looks like double-sided tape. It is double-sided tape it's sat up on. With a wire coming off either side going onto the, these uh, solder blobs either side. I shall take a photo of this uh, circuit board and we'll trace it all out uh, and reverse engineer it. So let's get this module out of here. I wonder why it's in a separate uh, capsule here. I wonder if it's designed whoop, to just be used in some different way. I wonder. I'm, I'm not sure why that is. Here's the, uh, there's the little magnet on the bottom of the flame. Quite a powerful little magnet. Could be neodymium iron boron. 
This may just clip together if it's not been heat staked together. I'm not really sure. Oh, it's glued. It's got the hot melt glue. Let's try and get the hot melt glue off. This is where I'm getting deja vu because not only actually I'm getting deja vu off that circuit board, I'm pretty sure I may have looked at this exact one before, but I'm not sure. Uh, people suggest that I could use um, isopropyl alcohol to loosen off this uh, hot melt glue. I've not tried that. I think I may try that afterwards. But at this point in time, let's use brute force and ignorance. It's my speciality. So this is held together with pins. There's the LED. That's quite a big LED. I think that's an 8mm LED with that rich golden phosphor at the back. It's, it's a very strict focal point. That is definitely, that's why they've used such a large LED. It's engineered, it's optimised, I've just pulled a lead off it, to focus onto a very specific point. It's quite harshly tapered. That's interesting. The pivot for the flame to allow maximum movement is just a piece of wire dipped uh, in like that. Let's uh, zoom up in this a little bit and see if we can see it better. So it's a little bit of wire that's designed to not only just provide freedom of movement, said Clive, pulling it out completely, but also uh, because it's tapered back, it's got a dip sort of further back from the LED. It means that the flame will automatically centre on that point. Uh, oh, I should stay in shot, shouldn't I? Uh, stay, it will centre in that point just at the right focal distance from the LED as it moves about. Um, the circuit board, I'll tell you what. I shall uh, go and take a picture of the circuit board uh, and then we'll reverse engineer it. That's what I'll do right now. So here is an image of the circuit board. It makes it much easier to follow. And I've also jumped the connection from the LED so we can actually see how the coil is being pulsed. And it's just a regular repeat pulse. Now, the circuitry breaks into two sections. It's got the negative and the positive from the battery pack coming on at the bottom here. And... The LED, it's quite odd, the LED has its negative uh, going under this pad, under the uh, chip, but it is just connected straight to the, the negative of the circuit. I get the feeling they've run the negative connection under here, so they've got the option that the same microcontroller, the same chip, could, uh, but it's probably not a microcontroller given it's just pulsing, but it's possible that they originally intended it to either turn the LED off after a sort of time delay, or gently undulate the LED up and down. They've left their options open there. But in this case, the negative of the LED is connected straight to the battery negative. The positive of the LED comes down, uh, a track goes underneath the coil here, and it goes through this 75 ohm resistor. 75, 0, 75, and a multiplier of 0, 75 ohms. Um, all the values are actually marked on the circuit board. 75 ohm, 100 ohm, and I wish I'd checked this before I measured it. 4148, which is a generic uh, low current diode. I actually measured the forward voltage drop of that, and it was 0.6 volts. It's a standard silicon diode. The capacitor is connected across these two connections here, and it's uh, 47 microfarad, 16 volt. I've put that upside down. I wondered if the capacitor, I wondered if this was going to be something as simple as the capacitor charging through this resistor until it reached a threshold. So I tried a different value of capacitor bridged across that and it didn't make any difference to the speed. So it is an internal clock frequency inside this chip. There's something underneath there. It's a small pip of solder. Okay. So let's doodle that down. We have the three cells. One, two, three. They could be Alkaline, or they could make nickel metal hydride. So that's the plus, say, worst case, 4.5 volts. But it will work down well below 3 volts. Uh, there's a switch on the positive connection. So there's a switch. And then it's just the rails after that. So the LED, for a start, goes from the positive. It's going from the positive connection through a 75 ohm resistor. So let's draw the LED in. There's the 75 ohms and that big chunky warm white sort of flame LED. I'll just draw the uh, arrows point in the other direction. For a change, I was thinking it would save space here, but then I've just written that there, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, the circuitry, it's quite odd. It goes through a 100 ohm resistor, 101, so that's 10 one and a multiplier of 0, 1, one zero in the end, so that's a 100 ohm. Um, and then it goes through the diode. Then 
I'm metered under and it goes to the positive rail of this chip. It is metered, it is direct connected through to this capacitor, which seems to be just a local power supply capacitor. I wonder if that's just to uh, allow it, this to trickle a certain amount of current, but that capacitor gives the coil that bit of oomph when it turns on. I'm guessing that's it, because um, that gives it an initial hard kick from the capacitor, and then this resistor here will limit the current. That's quite good. It's very low current, the whole operation of the circuit. So that's um, a 100 ohm resistor, 100 ohm, and it's going through a diode, and that's going to the capacitor. And that capacitor is 47 megfarad, 16 volts. The voltage they'll have chosen there is just the lowest they can get. You know, just this beyond a certain range, uh, the capacitor values won't go down any lower in a, the voltage because it's just not needed. Um, for these generic capacitors. So though it's only really operating at about peak 4.5 volts-ish, the 16 volt is their choice there just because it's the maximum voltage range of it. Then we've got the coil is coming off from here and going to that chip. And I'll just draw the chip as a box. And it's got one connection going to the ground. It's got connection going to, well, going up to that positive supply. And I'm guessing it's just a timer and then a transistor just pulsing that coil to ground. And that is more or less it. There's nothing else to it. It's a neat little circuit. It's totally evolved to the point of simplicity. Uh, yeah, not really much to say. You could actually use a 555 to do that. But to be honest, uh, things like this coil, which is a, uh, it's uh, one of those coils that is clearly been manufactured by sort of sandwiching it between two non-stick surfaces and then sort of winding a sort of sticky wire in. I don't know if they impregnate it with resin afterwards, but um, it's got no former as such. It is just loose wound coil. That's a really common uh, approach. I also, it reminds me a lot of this sort of pendulum uh, ornaments that swing backwards and forwards, the solar powered pendulum ornaments. <clears throat> so that's a neat design. It really has come down to the battery compartment, the uh, little uh, the circuit board that sits directly underneath the magnetically deflected flame and then that bright LED that's just focused onto, well, you can actually see if I point at the paper there, can you? Hold on, let's see if I can get a white, I'll bring the white notepad in and we'll take a look at the uh, LED's beam angle. Have I just, uh, I've just snapped a wire off. Let's not look at the, the beam angle of the LED. <coughs> Suffice to say, it is very narrow. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's quite a nice little, it's evolved nicely. I mean, it really is, it's gone to the point that it is just a mass-produced item now. That'll explain the low price. I wonder why they use the plastic cases. The original Luminara, should I say the wax cases? The original Luminara uh, used a wax case, and in a way I'd kind of prefer the plastic ones because it would let you unscrew things as opposed to it being sort of glued into very breakable wax. I broke several of these initially uh, when the first earliest ones came out. But having said that, you know, I suppose it's an ecologically good compound. That you, If wax goes in a rubbish, rubbish incinerator, it's just going to burn like candle wax. So maybe that is a good thing. I would like to try one of these outdoors. Uh, I don't know if I'd adapt it much. I'd maybe let it just, uh, I don't know if I'd, uh, I think the circuitry, water would get into it. Is that not shielded? It is shielded from water and grass in a way. You could lacquer it as well. So it could be made sort of outdoor safe. The LED would have to have sort of uh, lacquer or resin put around its leads to seal it against the corrosion. Um, and then you could possibly run it off a little solar panel or something like that. I like the idea of the flame just being affected by ambient wind outdoors. That's probably because of that Luminara one, the expensive candle that was rated for outdoor use. But yeah, it's quite a neat design, this one. It's really evolved quite quickly. It's uh, really streamlined the manufacturing process, and the circuitry is about as simple as it could get.